Welcome back to Botch But Works. Today I'm going to be talking about the brand new Shaper Origin Inverness update and I'll be sharing some more tips concerning my Shaper Origin workflow. First things first, I want to give a big shout out to the ever-growing Botch But Works community. We are steadily approaching 500 subscriptions. So thanks so much to everyone who's supported us. We'll have some more videos in the coming months. We're both doing our exam phases right now, so we're a bit stuck in editing, but New content is coming very soon. Now, I won't just be going over all the new features of this update because that's knowledge you probably already know, or if not, then I'll be putting the links to the official Shaper announcement of the Inverness update in the description. Instead, I wanna show you what advantages these new features bring and how they influence my workflow. And after that, we will be going over some viewer questions from the last Shaper Tips video, and I'll be showing some uh, fun and hopefully creative ways to uh, make some kinds of different projects, so stay tuned for that. First off, there were great improvements when doing a pocketing cut. I've just prepared a test file here and it has this kind of sharp corner over here. These kind of corners used to introduce like a tiny bit of jitter when the mill snapped over the top part here, but they've greatly improved that now. So if I try and demonstrate that, it just goes over there now, buttery smooth. And like, yeah, it's, it's really fun to do pockets now because of that new movement algorithm. So nice work shaper. The next thing is that you can now name your workspace the moment you've scanned it. Now that doesn't sound like an important uh, upgrade, but it allows you to be much more organized because usually you have your whatever piece of wood or something, put the tape on it, scan it, and then you already know kind of what project you want to do. And you can just enter that name and you don't have to click through sub menus like you had to before. And that allows you to later, if you, if you want to mill on that board of wood again, then you already have that name saved. And uh, for me at least, it would save me a lot of searching through unnamed workspaces. There's one feature I'd love to see on the machine concerning the safe workspaces, because in my case, I already have like 70 of them racked up. And that's especially from the scans I did on the Shaper workstation. And I'd love to see the option to delete multiple of these workspaces at once, because right now, as far as I'm informed, it's only possible to delete them one by one. The zoom was improved, so now it's possible to use the screen in this pinch and zoom way, like you know from your smartphone. The amount of double tap zoom levels was reduced to these two, so like the really far away perspective and the near one, so you don't have to traverse over that uh, third zoom level that used to be here, which is a nice speed up. And also if you place your model, um, I'm just gonna import this one again. And now if I move the machine, you can see that it zooms out automatically and it always keeps my placed uh, object here on the screen. And um, that also just speeds up your workflow because especially with larger models, you don't have to kind of search uh, where the, the edges are, but uh, the machine just keeps it on the screen. You can place it and then continue working. The next new feature is a cool one for me as an engineer because oftentimes I want to place models at an exact position and I used to do this by setting the grid spacing to 0.5 millimeters which was the minimal amount that the machine let me do and then I could for example space two parts exactly maybe eight millimeters apart so that the mill would fit in between or if there was an exact position on my workpiece that I wanted the part to be on and uh, of course you create your grid like on the on the bottom left um, edge for example of your workpiece then I wanted to go like 10 millimeters to the right 10 to the top um, that's how I did that by using the grid and moving the machine to that position. Now it's possible to actually set an, a position for your part. So first off you can set arbitrary positions, for example 0 0.3 millimeters or 5.7 and you don't have to move the machine there you can just enter it on the screen and that's especially handy if you duplicate parts. So if I want to make um, a set of maybe five holes that are spaced evenly and with a measurement of my choice, then I can just duplicate them and, and move them 
by using this position feature and um, get exactly the spacing that I want without having to uh, hand botch it exactly where I wanted to have it. So basically what I can do is when I import something, <laughs> I'm overusing this design, sorry for that. Um, I basically have this position feature up here and I can enter a value for the X and the Y axis. And I can also just enter the value for one axis and then it's gonna be locked on that axis. So if I maybe choose 415 millimeters in X direction from my grid on this part, then as you can see, the part stops moving in the X direction and I can just move it only in the Y direction. And if I lock that as well, whatever 200 may millimeters maybe then it's completely locked and I don't have to actually move the machine there like before the update so from an engineering perspective I really like this feature because it allows you to make really precise adjustments and not be uh, limited by your grid spacing when you wanted to mirror a part in the old uh, firmware version then you had to set a negative scale in the uh, width or height direction and I think we can all agree that it's much more comfortable just having dedicated buttons for that so that now I can just flip the part as much as I want. Another nice thing is that the transformations for example the rotation is now preserved when copying a part and let's move it to the right by let's say 50 millimeters so I'm just going to add plus 50 millimeters now it's moving over there and notice that it didn't snap to my cursor. So if I move the machine now, then I can move the part um, the traditional way. But right now I just want to move it by 50 millimeters um, independent of how origin is standing. And now I can, for example, rotate this by 60 degrees like this. And now if I copy, if I copy the copy, then the rotation is preserved and uh, you can see it says 60 degrees. So if I wanted to rotate it back, then I just enter zero degrees here and we're back to the old orientation. And I really like this principle of applying transformations because I've used software before uh, where you can, for example, rotate parts by entering 30 degrees and pressing apply. And then this transformation is baked into the part and the only way to go back is pressing Control Z, but after a few other operations, that's not possible anymore. And so to rotate it back, you'd have to apply a new transformation on top of the old one with a minus 30 degree rotation. And I personally don't like the fact that this type of workflow is kind of irreversible. So uh, I find it cool that on the Shaper Origin transformations are uh, always kind of kept as an information with a part and I can always access it um, if I copy a part then I have all the transformations of the original objects in there. The last feature that really sticks out to me in the Inverness update is the custom anchor. So while placing your part as a design you can kind of grab it either in the corners or in the middles of the edges or the center of the part. But in some parts for example if you have maybe a hole in the part that is rather important and you want that to be the center of the anchor so coordinates zero zero that wasn't possible and now you can just draw a small red triangle in your design check the uh, shaper announcement for a detailed explanation of how that triangle uh, needs to look and then that's where you can anchor your part you can still use the other anchor points but uh, that one becomes the new kind of center of interest and why that's so important is this part as a demonstration. This is a, a mounting bracket for my Glidecam. Uh, if you're interested, I put a small video about that on my Instagram. What I did was I milled it from both sides and basically on this side, the only thing I did with the Shaper Origin was this bevel here and the, the through hole. And then I flipped it around and did the other stuff. I did a mistake there and the holes didn't align and it was super annoying. And um, I found out why uh, afterwards. Let me show you an in Inkscape. What you can see here are the two designs for the bottom and the top side. And on the top side, I just made this bevel and the through hole. And then I flipped my wooden board around and did all the holes and the pockets and then cut it out. As you can see here, there are these two pockets that exceed the rectangle that I drew here to mark the, the actual size of the part. And that's because I wanted the mill to actually go outside of the part for this pocket because this is a recessed area and if I had defined the um, edges of this 
pocketing zone exactly on the edges of my part, then I might have had some material uh, still standing there and would have to work with like uh, offsets or something. So uh, this is a method that I found working to get the mill to actually leave the contour of your part and actually take away everything that I want taken away. The thing is, the rectangular bounding box that I defined in Inkscape isn't the same on the Shaper Origin, because Origin takes everything that it sees in the SVG file and that's the bounding box, so the outermost um, points of your design. The bottom side design, the, the left one on my Inkscape screen, which has these exceedingly large um, pocketing zones, has a larger bounding box than the top side design. And so when flipping that around, I made the mistake of uh, not aligning those two designs correctly because I thought uh, it should work if I just align the, the top edges, but that was the mistake. And so next time I'm just going to place a custom anchor, so this little red triangle, on a point of interest, in this case maybe one of the large holes on the exact center axis of my part and then this flipping problem won't happen anymore. That's why I think the anchor feature is one of the coolest ones of the new update because it'll allow me to make less mistakes and also for future projects make more complex transformations and forward backward cutting operations because I have much more control over how my design behaves when uh, editing on the Shaper Origin. All right, now let's transition over to the second part of this video, the Shaper Origin Work Tips Volume 2. Some of you asked me in the comments of the last Shaper Origin Tips video if I could explain how to do certain things with the Shaper Origin. And that's amazing because it's the first time I can directly react to questions coming from the Botchbit Works community. Well, except for that one time. During the course of the last few months, something amazing has happened. Over 20% of my subscribers have requested to get access to Blaze 3. The first question was about copying a real-world object or shape with holes in it, so making a, an actual hardware copy. And uh, it was asked if it's possible to do that kind of optically with the Shaper Origin, because of course you can just lay your original part on your table and scan it with the Shaper Origin, and then for example trace it with a pen tool and do the holes with like uh, circles. Um, but I don't think that's the best idea because the optical representation of the Shaper Origin is more like a reference. It doesn't actually represent uh, with high precision where the edges are and where the holes are going to be. Um, so I think using the pen tool for that copying operation would yield slightly imprecise results. So what I would do here is to uh, take a photo of your original part, like a top-down photo, you can use your smartphone and uh, try to get as far away from your part as possible so that you get a nice and coplanar photo. Or, a uh, special trick, uh, use a photocopier. So if your part is small enough, just place it on a copying machine and then you have an, uh, an exact flat representation of your part and can simply trace that in Inkscape. And I want to show you how to do that. The first thing is to import your photograph or your scan into Inkscape. Side note, while taking your photograph, try to keep it as high contrast as possible. So if you, for example, have a dark part, then place some paper under it or something. Don't photograph it on a black table, obviously. And if your part is rather bright in color, then try to use a dark background. So you have that separation of what your part is and uh, where it isn't. What you can see over here in Inkscape is a design that my sister made. Um, I showed you this in the making a laptop tray with Shaper Origin video. I traced these shapes with editing. So, so this is actually the, the photograph. The black parts are supposed to be cut out with Shaper Origin. What we have to do now is trace these shapes because right now it's just a photo consisting of uh, single pixels and what we want is to have these um, shapes as paths or vectors. So I'm going to go to trace bitmap in Inkscape and because the image is already fairly contrasty the uh, tracing here works okay and I could uh, tweak these parameters to compensate for maybe lower contrast or uh, some, some lighting glitches but I'm just gonna confirm this right now and now 
I can delete the original photograph and what I have here is a vector element. So if I show you this like this, there's a lot of individual points and I can basically drag them all around. The only thing you have to pay attention to is the scale um, of your photograph. Of course, Inkscape can't just determine that. So maybe photograph a ruler or photocopy a ruler with the rest of your shape. And then you can simply adjust the scale of everything in Inkscape optically using a, a digital ruler in Inkscape and match that with your photocopied ruler. And then everything will be exactly the size that you want. And of course you can also edit your design now so you can add holes or make uh, them larger or smaller. I find it a really nice way to kind of move into the digital world and be able to edit stuff and then you can cut it out uh, from the wood of your liking and you've made a copy of a part. So like a 3D printer but uh, made out of wood. One more thing I want to show you in this context. Um, we made a birthday present for a friend a few weeks ago and uh, that uh, included milling some uh, or engraving some numbers into these pieces of wood. So the photos, as you can see, uh, those were really uh, copied on a photocopier together with this uh, ruler. And then we were able to place the numbers and uh, avoid this kind of uh, bright part in the middle of the wood. That was the whole point of this operation. You might be able to see these blue um, lines. Those are lines that the Shaper Origin detects as a guideline so that won't be milled. That's just for me to see where the contour of the wood is because each of these pieces looks a bit different. And uh, yeah, it worked pretty great. I was able to just put them in the Shaper workstation and mill those numbers and uh, it was kind of unconventional way to put all of those wooden sticks on a photocopier. But as I said, it's a great way to get a planar photo and um, yeah, integrates really well into the Shaper Origin workflow. The second question was if it's possible to use such a countersink bit with the Shaper Origin. And in my opinion, yes, that's perfectly possible. The thing you have to take care of though is that you don't drag this bit through your material because it's not made for that. That's what conventional um, cutting bits are for. So you have to make sure that this only moves in a z-axis direction. And what I would do to achieve this is to make the diameter of your hole the same as your cutter diameter, at least on the Shaper Origin. So eight millimeter hole, then set your cutter diameter to eight millimeter as well. And then the bit will only move in that direction. And also you might wanna lower your plunge speed so that it doesn't go in too quickly. Also what I would do first is to cut a, um, maybe a smaller hole with another bit first so that this countersink bit doesn't have to plunge into the uh, unaltered material, but instead that there is all, uh, already a hole and then you can just um, bevel the edges of this hole using the Shaper Origin C axis. And um, yeah, that would be a quick way to make many of these and uh, also in a reproducible way because of course Origin always only plunges to the depth that you tell it to. So you could make maybe an array of beveled holes with this method. So I guess that should work. The next question was about my workflow of making a part that I have to mill from both sides. Now we talked about this a few minutes ago and like for flipping the design around, I would be using the new custom anchor feature. But the thing is, how do you mount your part to the table so that after flipping the Shaper Origin still knows like where the, the zero point of your grid is. So um, the first tip is <laughs> don't flip your part around. Try to find a way to only mill from one side. This is also a problem in traditional CNC milling because if you take your part out of your fixture, then you always leave that defined coordinate system and you have to basically find a way to get it back to that position as good as possible because otherwise you're going to have imperfections. If you have to mill from both sides, then uh, my first tip would be to um, have a part or your, your base material to have two perpendicular edges. In this case, uh, these are the two perpendicular edges of my piece. So now I can index these two sides with my shaper origin and define a grid. And the origin of that grid will be in this corner. Now I can mill and then I can flip the part around and reuse these two edges and re-index them the same way I did before. After that, I can make a new grid with Shaper Origin against the same edges. And then I have a defined grid 
that is going to align properly with the grid on the back side, so to speak. And if you align your back side design correctly and don't flip it in a wrong way as I did, then it's going to align pretty well with what you cut from the front side. My second idea would be to add two indexing holes to your design. Those have to be holes that are cut all the way through and that match the diameter of your cutting bit. So if this were the top side, you would um, do whatever you have to do and make these two holes and then you would flip the part round. In that case, it isn't really important where the part is on your table because these indexing holes are our new point of reference. And then I could place the shaper origin on top and plunge with my bit and kind of try and hit the holes and make a new grid with these two holes. That way you can get a pretty good indexed backside um, that matches with your front side. And if you don't want to use your precious milling bit for that, then you could also manufacture maybe a six millimeter metal rod or something so that you don't have to stick your cutter in there, uh, but can just use this kind of indexing bit. And yeah, that way create your grid on the back side and keep working. My third idea would be to use a custom jig. So if you have a part that is kind of weirdly shaped and doesn't have perpendicular edges and you don't want these two indexing holes, then you can always pre-plan a, a special jig that allows you to align the part, cut the top side and then flip it around and do the back side with a defined position. Of course, making a custom jig is rather time consuming and has to happen on a part to part basis. So check if one of the aforementioned methods works for you first. The fourth and last question for today is about miters. I was asked for a design of a box or a drawer, for example, if it was possible to create the 45 degree bevels using the shaper origin and a um, 90 degree cutting bit, for example. Oh, and using the workstation. So I think this is possible using the workstation. Uh, you could put all the parts in one by one and um, do one edge, then flip it by 90 degrees and so on. But I think that you can also do it in the flat sheet of wood. So not using the workstation at all, but just cutting it out um, as it is from a flat sheet. And we're going to try that now. I've designed a small uh, five-sided box uh, it's really tiny and it's just for testing purposes, but we're going to try it out. I haven't tested this yet, so um, you're going to see my uh, trial and error now and see if we can make this, these nice um, beveled edges and if it fits together afterwards. I'm going to be using the three millimeter cutter to um, just uh, cut in some uh, design lines that I added. Then after that, I'm going to trace the contours of the five squares uh, with a six or eight millimeter cutter, um, just so that the uh, beveling bit doesn't have to take away all that material. So I'm not going to cut all the way through with that eight millimeter cutter. And after that, we're going to grab the bevel bit and go around each of the parts, cutting them out and adding that nice miter to the edges. Every time I do a bit change, the Shaper Origin song plays in my head. Cool. 
those turned out pretty nice, although there is still like a bit of an uh, unwanted edge standing because my uh, mitering bit isn't long enough. So I'm just going to file that down and it's just on the inside. So um, the, the outer edges I think are, are fine. And uh, yeah, then we can make a test fit. And I've got them all finished and they do look quite cute. So now it'll be my job to assemble a cube out of this. Never done this before, so gonna have to trust in my motor skills. <coughs> Comment below if I'm doing this completely wrong. Yeah, that's that's the result. So um, gonna have to clean up the edges a bit and of course glue it together. So as a proof of concept, I think this is pretty nice. And uh, as you could see, I did basically everything with the Shaper Origin with the exception of filing off the last bit of the edges. But if you have larger V-cut bit, then you don't have to do that at all. Yeah, I guess I'm going to finish this up, glue it together, maybe add some oil and I'll be posting some images of the finished cube uh, on my Instagram, so be sure to follow me there for an update on this one. That's it for today. I hope I could inspire and motivate you to try out all the new features of the Inverness update and maybe try a few new techniques that I showed you at the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't, please subscribe. We will be posting more videos coming in August and September. We really hope to see you there and if you have any further questions about anything you saw today then please write it in the comments and I'll try to get back to you personally or in the next video. See you then, bye! Mehr habe ich auch nicht zu sagen. Brauchst gar nicht weiter draufhalten. Ja, sorry.